what we've done in the past with regard to this issue is we've approached it from a polemical standpoint, right? We always seem to be on the defense, okay? This was what was said about an issue regarding race or racism. We've got to correct it. I think, I think what, we, what we wanted to do uh, in our conversation was we wanted to begin from the beginning and talk about the human race uh, that God created in His image and His likeness and the beauty of created order. Uh, and, and from that, we talk about the fact that sin enters the world, uh, the impact of sin entering the world, and, the, and then this, the segregation, segmentation as a result. Genesis chapter 4, you have two brothers who come out of the same womb who are at, at odds with one another. Who, who are, who are, there's hatred between one brother and, the, and, his, and his brother. So we, we talk about that and unpack the differences therein. And so we, we, we really want to talk about the beauty of God's creation and in the different diversity that's there, the level of melanin and skin and the beauty that 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 how that how that redounds back to the very glory of God, uh, and then how sin enters into that space, segregates and separates us and causes problems. But at the end of the day, the the, the, the beauty that that results as uh, as a part of the gospel, the message of the gospel. I completely agree. This is a, a huge opportunity for Christians to shed wisdom on the subject. But in order to do that. We have to know what scripture says about the subject. Uh, you know, so, so when you talk about uh, an issue such as what we call racial reconciliation, uh, what Virgil and I do, one of the many uh, texts of scripture that we uh, go back and sort of exposit is Acts 17, 26, that we all call come from one man. In, in God's providence and his sovereignty, he created every people group, every ethnicity on the face of the earth from one man. However, we don't stop there. So that's the what that God did. But in the following verse in Acts 17, 27, God explains why he did that. So we have to know the gospel to maybe explain just not just the commonality that we had in coming from one Adam, but we're talking about a teleology here. There's also a teleology in God creating that diversity, that, that, that uh, diversity of ethnicity, that diversity of culture, which in the following verse says God did that so that we would seek him, that we would worship him. So it's ultimately for God's glory, not ours, uh, that we have this sort of uh, multiplicity of diversity across the globe that we have today. You know, there's unity in the human race by creation. There's, there's unity in sin as well because we're all sinners. Mm -hmm. But then when the gospel comes, when the gospel comes, there is a unity that breaks down a lot of those natural barriers that would keep people apart. And it seems like in a lot of the discussions about this topic today, that the, the significance of the gospel is downplayed. Yes. Like it's, well, yeah, we're all Christians, right. but I'm a black Christian <clears throat> yeah. or I'm a white Christian right. rather than seeing that, no, this is a totalizing reality yeah. whenever you're in Christ. Yes, yeah, so totally. I, I love how you put that, Tom, a totalizing reality. It's a universal reality. And, you know, I have to say, one of the most asinine things that I think that is, is going on right now in the church today is, is, is that uh, anyone would boast about their skin color as if they had anything to do with that. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with that. So for you to identify yourself as a black Christian is actually putting your place in the place of God as if you can take credit for that. Now, if God doesn't make such distinctions, why should you? We make a distinction between biblical reconciliation and the rec reconciliation that the world is proffering. The world is proffering you a manufactured reconciliation whereby if you follow certain tenets of the law, you can achieve some sort of legal rec reconciliation, but you'll never achieve the reconciliation that connects us at the heart level. It's the difference between us being vertically reconciled to God and the outflow of that being horizontally reconciled to one another. But what the world is proffering is only that horizontal reconciliation that is temporary, it's subjective, it's unpredictable, it's not lasting, and which is why now, uh, almost what, 60 years, 60 some odd years later, after all of this civil rights legislation has been passed, we're still having these same conversations again. Add, add to that the fact that what they're offering is not true reconciliation. Right, it, it, it's a temporary band-aid and a fix for something that ultimately will, will, will undo itself uh, based upon the next level of leadership, next next political move that takes place. It just depends upon what's at hand. When, when we look at scripture, you go to Revelation 7, 9, we see that every tribe, tongue, and nation is there before the throne of God worshiping Him. And the focus is not their differences in that that is the end result. What's in focus there is that salvation belongs to our God. 
that's what's in focus there. So when we think about the fact that, that this is the, the, the end result, God gets the glory due his name through the diversity of these different people groups that he's created, that's what's important. The fact that he's thought about this before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter one, and had a plan for their redemption, recognizing that sin was going to enter is incredibly important. I, I, I love the, the section of scripture that I've often heard you walk through, Vodi, where you, where you walk through uh, the back half of Ephesians two. Uh, with the fact that we've been reconciled. Reconciliation, everything that the world is after in what they're calling reconciliation has already taken place through Christ. If we want to act, if we want to experience true reconciliation, that only comes through the blood of the lamb and, and, and through the message of the gospel. In, in traveling here, I thought about this. I was, I was traveling, I was, on the, I was at the airport going from one gate to the next gate. And as I went to that gate, I looked around to see the beauty of creation, the beauty of all of these different people, uh, of different hues, uh, from different places, all designed very uniquely and incredibly. And I thought, that is exactly what God would do. You remember when you were a kid and you got, you got the, the, as a gift, a crayon box? Uh, you were excited to get the crayon box with the 16. Some of you had the crayon box with the 32 colors. But, but if you were really special, you got the crayon box with the 160 some odd colors of different, you know, uh, hues and different looks and different colors. You knew that you had made it because you had gotten this beautiful crayon box. That's the creator. He, he was able to, to paint mankind in his image and in his likeness and create with every level and layer of melanin the most beautiful spectrum of mankind that we can have. That's something that should be celebrated. That's something that we should embrace. That's something that we should absolutely enjoy. When we talk about issues around race, more times than not, we begin with the end in mind. The reality is we have to go back to the beginning. And we have to begin with God. The focus is often on skin color or skin tones or melanin or uh, which ethnic group is pitted against that ethnic group. And at the end of the day, we have to go back biblically, scripturally to who God is. God is sovereign. Uh, he created the world. He created mankind in his image and likeness. And so if we're gonna have an honest conversation about race, it's gotta begin with God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And as a result of, of God's created order, the pinnacle of creation is humankind, is mankind. God creates Adam in his image and likeness. And as a result of, of God creating mankind in his image and likeness, he gives him distinct value, dignity, and worth. And, and, and as a result from there, what he, what he does is he, he then creates Eve. From the rib of man comes Eve. And she's there as a helpmeet. She's called alongside him to help him, to, to, to be there with him as they together advance the very kingdom of God. They've been given dominion, and as a result of, of their dominion, they're an extended hand of God on earth. What happens thereafter is that as a result of, of the fall, sin enters the world, and humanity is forever changed. Um, two brothers are then born, Cain uh, and Abel. Uh, the, the two brothers, because of sin's entrance into the world, have hatred in their heart, one against the other. There's division. And because of that, one brother kills the other brother. And, and it's there. We, we have a tendency to look at today, to look at the now and see differences between one another with regard to levels of melanin in one's skin. But this is, this is a result of sin going all the way back to the very first story with, with Cain and Abel. Sin's entrance into the world, hatred in the heart, of a brother against his own brother. And what, what results is, is death. Romans chapter five makes this incredibly 
clear that through one man, sin enters the world. Sin enters mankind. And we are systemically impacted as a result. I think about that word systemic. It's a word that comes up all the time in conversations about race. You know, I'm gonna put that word in quotation marks and I'll explain why in just a second. But by definition, anything that is systemic, by definition, is pervasive. That means it's everywhere. It's unavoidable by definition. And that's what sin is to the human race. Sin is systemic. So ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden in Genesis 3, we, as, our, as their progenitors, inherit that same sin nature. That's what makes it universal. There's one thing that we can say about every one of the seven plus billion people on this planet right now, is that every one of them is a sinner. So when you look at the depths of the effects of sin on the human heart ever since Genesis 3, you have to understand that the, convers w w the conversation really isn't about race. That's, the, that's, that's not really what the conversation is about. The question is the heart and how it is that I can look at a person who doesn't look like me and, and, and conjure up and develop and form and shape sinful biases and attitudes towards that person. No amount of reparations is going to uh, remedy that. Uh, no amount of, of positions of power is going to remedy that, okay? No amount of hiring black people as diversity officers in corporate America is going to handle that. No amount of quotas is going to deal with that. Only the gospel deals with that. Only the gospel deals with that. This is the perspective, the idea of minimizing the Imago Dei and amplifying um, that which is temporal, that which is, is, is temporary, right? Race, uh, ethnicity, skin color. Um, you, we see that with Samuel Morton in the late 1800s um, and his false science of craniometry. Um, what he would do is he, he grabbed these, these skulls and decided on the basis of their size that one had more value, one had greater value than the other. And as a result of, of a smaller size skull that one could be discarded, maybe they weren't truly an image bearer, maybe they, maybe they could be treated differently, inhumanely. Uh, and, and as a result of that false science, we get the idea, the unbiblical idea of races of humankind. When you look at what Morton did in collecting human skulls, um, and then sort of creating this out of his quote unquote science, and his scientific discoveries, whereby he uh, uh, developed the idea of human races on the basis of his craniometry categories there. But when you think about what came out of that, the, 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 the discoveries of Morton, it totally goes against what we see here in Acts 17, 26, as it relates to the Imago Dei. Now one would think that, well, if God made from one man every nation, every people group, every one, that that would give inherent value to every person because God created every person. You would think that. But see, here's where the sin, the effect of sin comes in. It totally warps even what is evident or what it should be evident to us that we were all created in the image of God. So you have a guy like Samuel Morton and perhaps go a, a, a few years earlier than him to, to a Charles Darwin, they will take these human man-centered ideas and down through the decades and through the years, those ideas are extrapolated and applied in society and in the church to a great extent to where we disregard the truth of the gospel here totally reject what God says here, that every human being was created in the image of God. We totally reject that, and we trade that off for this human worldview that there's different races of people now 
who are who vary in intelligence by virtue of their ethnicity, just by virtue of their existence. Some are more intelligent than others. Some are, and, and by virtue of that, some are more valued or less valued than, than others. So when you reject the word of God, when you reject the, the value that is inherent to each of us by virtue of having been created in the image of God, and you trade that off from an imago homo, the image of man view, so what, to where your, your, your visage of humanity goes from being one that's vertical to one that's horizontal, then that opens the door to things like slavery. That is the effect of sin. That is the gravity, that is the weight of sin in the human heart. And as I sit here right now in this chair, I'm speaking to you as someone who is descendant from black African slave owners. Black African slave owners. So sin is systemic. And the irony here is, is that you're not going to remedy any of that with more laws. You will not legislate hatred out of a person's heart. There's a natural response. There's a human response to injustice. There absolutely is. That human response represents itself more times than not in political action. Uh, and what we see culture beginning to do is to, 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 to push back against the injustice through political action. So, so there's, the, there's the advance of civil rights in current culture. Uh, the thought behind that is if I can get my rights back, um, those rights that have been granted uh, in, or taken away in most instance, instances by government, if I can rally enough people to my side and advance the cause of, of my civil rights uh, to, the, to the point where a majority believes that I should have these rights, then my side wins. Well, the, the problem with that is, is it ignores that these rights that we have are given to us by God. That as image bearers of God, we're deserving of distinct value, dignity, and worth. Uh, again, it amplifies government and minimizes God. We've got to get back to it. one of the things that was great about the civil rights movement was the fact that that, that men men like Martin Luther King did did a few things right. Here's one of the things that he got right. The civil rights movement actually got right that we are image bearers of God. When they amplified that message, they anchored their argument into a basic truth that takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter three. Where things begin to go awry is when the thought process is when we have to get we have to get those rights back from government. The transformation of the human heart doesn't come from government. It actually comes from God. We've got to recognize and realize that. And that's only done through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fortunately, the, the message of the gospel is that Christ lives lives the perfect life and that life is accredited to us. And that as a result, we're justified. We, we stand right before a holy God as a result of what Christ did on the cross for us. Now, that, that righteousness is, is accredited to our account. It, it's, it's not yet lived out in full. We are still sinners. We are still sinful. Because we're sinners, we're still sinful. So someone may ask, well, uh, Jonathan Edwards owned slaves, George, George Whitefield owned slaves. Well, how could a regenerate believer do that? Because that regenerate believer is still a sinner. They're still indwelling sin in their heart. And that indwelling sin is never going to be fully and finally dealt with until we're in our glorified bodies. Regenerate doesn't mean glorified. It doesn't mean perfect obedience. The church is full of redeemed, sinful believers. It's something that we, we walk through the process of sanctification. I, th I think about this in, the, in the, the way of the life of Peter, right? Here's a man who walked with Christ. Here's a man who got to hear the Sermon on the Mount. He got to be there at the feeding of the 5,000. He, he got to witness not only the death, but the very resurrection of the Son of the living God. 
And still, in spite of all that, when he gets to Galatia, he, he, he's in, in, involved in a situation where the Jews show up and the fear of man begins. And rather than eating with the Gentiles, he separates himself again, causing the, the gospel to be in question. Paul, as he writes to the Galatian church, it actually expresses the fact that he had, to, he had to deal with Peter on this particular issue and confront him to his face. Now, if, if, if any of us uh, could say that we've been, we've been changed or transformed by the gospel, none of us can say. We actually walked with Christ when he fed 5,000, when he, when he was crucified, when he's raised from the dead, and yet Peter, even with all of that exposure to the truth of God firsthand, still walked in this sinful way. How can we not expect that we as mere human beings far removed from that event taking place would, would do the same? The beauty of the gospel is that we, we walk out righteousness through the process of sanctification and ultimately are glorified as a result of what Christ has done on our behalf. When I think about the, the picture that, that God gives us in Revelation chapter 7 beginning in verse 9, um, I think the picture is absolutely clear what God's intent was. It reads this, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation from all tribes and people and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels are standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and they worship God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever, amen. We have that picture. That picture is not a part of what man does by the work of his hand. That's the plan of God from the very beginning. As sin entered the world, right, through Adam and Eve, as, as, as Cain and Abel, begin to, to, to manifest the, the anger, the rage, the hatred. The reality is God had a plan to, to redeem mankind, that these brothers would one day be able to, to get along. Ephesians chapter 2 kind of bears that out. Um, verse 13, but now in Christ, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. There was a dividing wall of hostility between those brothers. And, and Christ is the, is the solution, is the answer for that. The reconciliation that Paul is emphasizing in Ephesians 2 is first and foremost a vertical reconciliation. That dividing wall exists primarily between us and God. Until we're able to, through faith in Jesus Christ, overcome that wall, then the walls that exist horizontally between us will always remain there. Always remain there, even in the church. The, the beauty of reconciliation is that God has both in view. The fact that you want to reconcile with your brother it, it, there's, there's something much deeper driving that. It, it's the fact that you are out of sorts with God himself. The sinfulness in the human heart has caused you to be separate from God. And as God sends his son, reconciling you unto himself, the passion that you feel to be reconciled with your brother can be truly and beautifully manifested. Because one, you've been reconciled first to God, and then to your brother in its proper order. This is your responsibility. This is my responsibility. This is Virgil's responsibility. Ephesians chapter five, verse one. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ 
also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. As we take this personally to obey, then we see true biblical reconciliation, which is first and foremost spiritual reconciliation. Then it's temporal. It's spiritual first, then it's temporal in the world. That's how we bring this sort of uh, heavenly idea down to earth so that it works itself out practically and tangibly in ways that an unbelieving world can recognize and wonder, wow, what's, what's happening with, with these guys over here? I, I see these, these different people groups get, getting together and, and praising the Lord. Back in Acts 17, 27, God created all these different ethnic groups and people groups so that they might worship him. It's exactly what Virgil was pointing out in Revelation 7. What's happening in Revelation 7 is the focus isn't the, 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 that, they're, that they're, they're, they're people of various tongues and ethnicities. The point of Revelation 7 is that they're there all worshiping God. God is the focus of Revelation 7, not us. God is. So with reconciliation, the, 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 the end of the story is not us. It's not about us coming together. It's about us being reconciled to God and worshiping Him in the manner that He created us to do. Let me take you to the plan of God in eternity past. In Ephesians chapter 1, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we will be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestines us for adoption as sons. This is the answer, this is the solution. This is the plan of God in eternity past. This is in the mind of God before he ever said, let there be light. He had a plan, recognizing that sin would enter the world and that one brother would have hatred for another. He had a plan, a plan to redeem mankind, to make that which was broken, that which was lost, that which had sinned against one another, uh, to unite them again under, under one banner, that banner of love, which is Christ and Him crucified. That's the message of the gospel. That is the beauty of true reconciliation. Reconciliation, not of races, but reconciliation of one race, one human race of mankind restored back to God the Father.